Welcome back, everybody, to the Miami Marlins franchise here on MLB The Show 23. Today, we will be kicking off the month of May here in season number three. Things have gone really well so far this year. We're 18 and 14. We're coming off a series win against a really good Diamondback squad. And we're only a game out of first place in the division. And we are currently head of the Atlanta Braves, who have built kind of a super team. We are currently the number two wild card in the National League, a little bit behind the Dodgers, who we're going to face off against later today. We'll be taking our first look at the farm system this season as well today. We've seen top prospects like Woody Landry and Yuri Perez get called up within the last season or so. We only have one more eight potential prospect in the system right now, but we do have a lot of other guys scattered throughout the farm system who I am excited to take a look at. We'll start with the Pensacola Blue Wahoos, who are currently second place in their division. They've got some notable names, including Ronald Andino, our first round pick last year, who's gotten off to a slow start, only hitting 184. Certainly hoping he can pick it up. He's not a great contact hitter yet, but obviously 184 is not very good. So he's got to play better. Oswaldo Batias, our international free agent signing. Joel Beltran, a competitive balance first round pick a couple years ago who's been pretty disappointing this season. We do have some other guys playing well, though. Dominique Sierra has been impressive. Jose Gerardo has been better than last year. And the pitching, we've got a good group of young guys. Hitoki Nomo, our second round pick, has the second highest potential of any prospect in the entire organization. We're going to be taking a look at Cameron Norman today on the mound as we face off against the Mississippi Braves, who are currently in first place in our division. Of course, they are the AA affiliate of, you guessed it, the Atlanta Braves. Pensacola is currently 14-9. The Blue Wahoos have made the AA Championship Series two years in a row. We won in Season 1. We lost last year. I don't think the roster is as good as it's been, especially offensively, but we do still have the number one ranked team in all of AA in terms of on-paper talent. There's a look at both lineups and the pitcher for Mississippi, Jeff Criswell. 3.86 ERA, 1.24 whip. Pretty solid season for him as he faces off against Ronald Andino, the 11th overall pick in last year's draft, hailing from Puerto Rico as he singles into left field. So Andino is quickly aboard to start the ball game. We'll see if the middle of the order can drive them in. That'll bring up Oswaldo Batias. He was the Marlins international free agent signing this past year. He's been pretty up and down so far at the plate as he strikes out on the fastball. Good pitch by Criswell. That'll bring up Jose Gerardo, who, of course, lost, I guess, the dud of the year last year for the minor leagues. He has been better this season, as he's going to get a weak single, but a base hit nonetheless. And so there's now two runners aboard and two outs. A major opportunity here for the catcher, Joel Beltran, hitting a measly 164 on the year. That is not good, as he bops it up in the left, and it'll be caught as the Braves get out of the inning. So Mississippi allows two, but nobody will come home. Let's take a look now at Cameron Norman. He was drafted in the fourth round of our first draft out of the University of Maryland. He was pretty good last season and has played just fine this year as he faces off against Dominic Fletcher. Had some big league experience with the Arizona Diamondbacks within the last few years as he singles into left field. So that'll give the Braves a base runner for Bryson Horn. Grounds it over to third. Yidi Cape, who's had a pretty bad season offensively, makes the play. And so Cameron Norman gets out of the inning, only allowing one runner. No score going into the second. Yidi Cape was second place for the minor league dud of the year last year. And he's been probably even worse this year. But he does single into left field. Good to see him swinging the bat well in what has been a very disappointing season at the plate for him. So Cape is aboard, and that'll bring up Norel Gonzalez, a talented young outfielder. Gets a hanging pitch, and he crushes it into right field. If you're going to lob him a meatball right over the middle of the plate, you should expect that ball to be out of the stadium. Gonzalez does exactly that. His third home run of the season, 390 feet, and the Pensacola Blue Wahoos take a 2-0 lead here in the top of the second. Great swing from Norel Gonzalez taking that one deep. Drew Milius will answer right back here in the bottom of the second as he homers for the Mississippi Braves, and they'll make it 2-1. Good swing there from Millis, his first home run of the year. So both teams go deep here in the second inning. Stephen Paolini, not quite done yet. Back-to-back -back homers for Mississippi, and we're all of a sudden tied at two. The offense is making some plays here in the second inning. 
Paolini with his third homer of the season. Cameron Norman frustrated with himself as he allows back-to-back -back diners. He's going to allow another base runner here. David McCabe draws a walk. That'll bring up the number nine hitter, Cody Milligan. McCabe looking ahead for second as Milligan gets a base hit into right. Runner will head over to third. So now the Braves have runners on the corners here. Ideally, you got to get the ball on the ground here for a double play as that'll bring up the top of the order. And Andrew Moritz, who hits this one foul into right field. But unfortunately on that play, Norel Gonzalez, the right fielder who hit the home run earlier, got injured. He messed up his calf. It could be a minor injury or he could have tore it. Not good. So Ishmael Alcantara will replace him in right. I don't know why Gonzalez decided to die for the ball. I mean, he was not even close to it. But yeah, now he is injured. And now the Braves are going to take the lead as Andrew Moritz. He will hit this one into the left field corner. Two runs will score. It's an RBI double for Moritz. And it's now 4-2. to two. It's been a pretty disastrous bottom of the second inning for Pensacola. They have one of the better offensive players injured. And the Mississippi offense is on fire. Well, the fireman was not able to cool it off quite yet as Dom Fletcher hits it sharply in the left. Another run scores. Fletcher's going to make it over to second. Just kind of a lazy effort from the Pensacola defense, and Fletcher turns a single into a double. Luckily, he wouldn't score, but it is now 5-2. to two. Oswaldo Matias will look to cut into the lead a little bit as he crushes it in a right center field, and that one is gone. Solo home run for Oswaldo Matias. And the Pensacola Blue Wahoos cut into the lead. It's 5-3. Matias with his third homer of the season. Signed out of Venezuela this offseason. And then Joel Beltran, the very next batter, belts one into right. And now it's 5-4. The big guns have come out early today with five homers combined. And we're not even halfway through the third inning yet. Beltron with his third of the year. We know he hits for great power. We need to see the average and the contact get better. But he's got a lot of pop in the bat. Victor Victor Mesa up now with two away. And he will check his swing. That'll be a strikeout. But still a pretty good inning. As Eduardo Matias and Joel Beltron go back to back. Putting the Blue Wahoos back in the game. Drew Millas, who had one of the homers earlier from the Braves, strikes out. Cameron Norman looking to get back into a groove as he now faces off against EJ Exposito. Hits that one off of Norman's leg. Going to be a close play at first, and he got him! Good play by Cam Norman to throw him out as it remains 5-4. to four. Very high-octane game through the first few innings. We'll see if both of these offenses can stay hot now into the fourth. Dominique Sierra strikes out. Quick 1-2-3 inning for Mississippi. A lot better for the Braves. We'll see if they can extend the lead here in the bottom of the fourth as David McCabe singles into left, quickly getting past the glove of Ronald Andino. Cody Milligan up now. He draws a walk. And Cameron Norman again is starting to struggle, allowing base runners just like in the second inning. So he'll be taken out and be replaced by Fernando Cortez, who was drafted in the sixth round of our first draft. He faces off against Andrew Moritz, who grounds it to third. Cape unable to tag the runner, and he gets one out. How do you not tag him? I mean, what are we doing here? That'll bring up Richie Martin. Has some time with the majors with the Orioles as he hits this one down the line, and that'll score two. Martin looking to dig in for third, and he is safe with a two-run triple, and the Mississippi Braves now lead it 7-4. Dominic Fletcher hits this one up the middle. Dominique Sierra will make the play, but Richie Martin will score, and so it is now 8-4. Beginning for the Braves. We'll see if they can keep it going with Bryson Horn up. Lines at the third. Nice catch by Cape. Nearly hit him in the nuts, but still a pretty bad inning as the Blue Wahoos allow three, and the deficit increases. Ryan Jackowitz is into the game here for Mississippi in the top of the fifth. He'll face off against the young center fielder, Anthony Piguero. He goes down on the low slider. That was a nice pitch. Creeping towards the bottom of the strike zone. Ronald Andino up now, and he'll go down on the curveball. Jaxowicz clearly has some nasty breaking balls showing him there. Stephen Paolini strikes out here in the bottom of the fifth. Fernando Cortez starting to pitch pretty well out of the bullpen as he will face off against Exposito, who hits this one into right. That'll go for a hit. So with two away, the Braves get another base runner. We'll see if they can get a little two-out rally and looks to extend the lead as David McCabe singles into left. And the Braves just continue to smack the ball. Their offense has been nothing short of incredible here.
but Cortez will get out of the inning as he strikes out Cody Milligan. It'll remain 8-4 to four going into the 6th. Something's got to give. We'll see if the offense can get hot again as Joel Beltran crushes another one. Beltran with his second homer of the ball game, and it's now 8-5. to five. The reason why the Marlins drafted Beltran was for his pop. 35th overall, hailing from Cuba out of Mississippi State, showing off the power with a multi-homer game. Victor Victor Mesa draws a walk, and so Pensacola's got a base runner here. We'll see if they can really take a big dig into this deficit. With two outs, Ishmael El Contra hits this one into right center. That one's going to drop, so now there's runners on the corners here. What an opportunity for the number nine hitter, Dominique Sierra, who lacks pop, but he is hitting over 300 this year. Hits that one sharply in the left. That's going to drive in a run, and things are now getting interesting. RBI single for Sierra, a third rounder a couple years ago, and it's now 8-6. That'll bring up Anthony Peguero. He lines this one nicely into center. That's going to drop for a hit, and it's now 8-7. RBI single for Peguero, and the offense is coming alive. We've got ourselves a ball game. Alex Siegel will come in out of the bullpen to try to get out of the inning. Full count for Andino, who pops this one up into shallow left center. It will be caught, but still a really good inning for Pensacola. They drive in three with a homer from Joel Beltran and a pair of RBIs from Dominique Sierra and Anthony Peguero. In the bottom of the six now, Andrew Moritz hits this one down the line. The Braves quickly looking to answer as Moritz is aboard with a base hit. Cortez has pitched pretty well over the last few innings, but here in the sixth, he is not starting off well. Richie Martin, who had the two-run triple back in the fourth, hits this one down the line. Runner's going to look to score. The throw to the plate is not in time. RBI double for Richie Martin, and it's now 9-7. Bryson Motts will come into the game to replace Cortez. He'll face off against Dom Fletcher. Slaps this one into the opposite field. That one could go for extras, and it's now 10-7. So Pensacola scored three in the top half of the inning. Mississippi's already got two, and they're going to add another one. Bryson Horn rips it into the gap. Mesa gets to it quickly, but it'll be an RBI double, and it's now 7-11. to 11. So the Braves have completely answered back with three runs of their own, and there's still nobody out. Drew Millis grounds this one over to short. Tough play for Andino. Throw to first, not in time. Now there's runners on the corners. Still nobody out for Stephen Paolini, who grounds it to short. Big double play. The Blue Wahoos needed that one. But Mississippi drives in a run, and it's 12-7. EJ Exposito then crushes this one into left, and it's now 13-7. Mississippi has only scored in three innings today, but in those innings, they've scored 5, 3, and 5. Pensacola's third pitcher of the inning now. It's Anthony Maldonado, who faces off against McCabe. Flies this one into right. To the warning track, it's caught by Alcantara. A big inning for both teams. Pensacola scores three. Mississippi scores five. We would not have much offense after that. So we're going to go into the top of the ninth. Pensacola down to their final strike as Jose Gerardo grounds out over to third. They get the force out at second. And the Mississippi Braves win it 13-7 in a very high-scoring game. I feel like every game we've played so far in Season 3 with the Big League Club has been super low-scoring. I think the most combined runs we've had in one of the Major League games that I've played this year is like 6. So naturally here, we're going to have 20. Our team hit the ball well. We hit for a lot of power. Homers for Noel Gonzalez, Oswaldo Batias, and then 2 for Joel Beltran. The problem is the pitching was an utter train wreck. Mississippi's offense was dominant in this game. They hit for power, they consistently hit to all fields, and their pitching wasn't great, but they did enough to win by six. Let's now move over to AAA. We've got the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp, who are 16-13, and 13, which is much better than last year. Last season, this team had the worst record in all of AAA, which is weird because the roster was pretty good. We've got some notable prospects, including Khalil Watson, who's been pretty solid after a great season last year in AA. Gennaro Miller, the two-way star. Kevin Alcantara is a great outfield prospect. Xavier Edwards has been pretty good, but the pitching is what I'm really excited about here. A lot of good players here. Max Myers having a solid year, so is Connor Prelop. And of course, our number one prospect, not counting Woody Landry, is Robbie Jones, followed by Gennaro Miller, who is the third-ranked prospect, although I really think Jones and Miller are the two best players in the farm system. Not just prospects, but 
players. These guys are really good right now. Gennaro Miller could be inserted into the Marlins rotation right now, and I think he could be a pretty good pitcher. He's a big league caliber player who's completely dominating these AAA hitters, and offensively, he's pretty good too. He can hit the ball as well. The only reason why he's not in the majors right now is because there's not really a clear role for him on the team, but he is a big league caliber player at this point. As for Robbie Jones, he has a higher potential rating than any prospect in the organization. We drafted him in season one in the second round. He was great last year in double A. He's been great so far in triple A. Wherever he's pitched, he's been really, really good. I really wanted to get a look at Robbie Jones on the mound in specific here because I think this is somebody who could be a future all-star for us down the line. So we're going to see him here against the Buffalo Bison, the AAA affiliate of the Toronto Blue Jays. Both the Bisons and the Jumbo Shrimp are 16 and 13, so we'll see which team can get the upper hand on the other. We've got this guy throwing out the first pitch here. We'll see what he can do. Oh man, right down the middle. That one's going 450 dead center. Let's take a look at both lineups here. Regular starters for Jacksonville. Gennaro Miller hitting in the five hole is the DH. Here's a look at Robbie Jones making his sixth start of the season here in Jacksonville. He has been phenomenal so far. Don't let the 0-2 record fool you. He's been great other than the strikeouts, which we know he's not all that great with. What a play from Khalil Watson early here in the top of the first inning. Watson's a very solid defensive player. He can play second and short, and offensively, he's pretty good too. Paxton Schultz is on the mound for the Bisons. He's been pretty solid this year as he strikes out Ryan Poles, the third rounder out of Hostra last year, who goes down chasing on the slider. That was ugly. Aurelvis Martinez hits this one well into the gap. That'll go for extra bases. Martinez was a guy throughout season one who I had on my radar as a trade candidate. He hasn't really developed all that well over the past couple of seasons, but he was a guy at one point in time I really wanted. Austin Barnes, the veteran big league catcher, goes down looking. Kate Dottie strikes out on the curveball. Robbie Jones is not a strikeout guy, but he's getting these guys to go down. Oscar Mercado singles into right. Runner's going to look to head home. The throw is offline, but the tag is put in in time. What a play by the catcher, Michael Koo. Despite the throw from the right fielder, Ethan Wilson, being a little bit offline, Koo quickly gets possession of the ball, and is able to locate the runner for an awesome tag. That was a pretty good throw by Wilson, but a phenomenal play by the catcher, Michael Koo. Bottom two, Aaron Sabato gets plunked. He was part of the Gene Segura trade last year with Minnesota. Gennaro Miller lines that one to short, and he will deflect it, and they will get the out at second. An unconventional out, as Aaron Sabato was sliding to second, he hurt his knee. Doesn't look like a serious injury, but he will have to be taken out of the game. First, Norell Gonzalez tweaks his calf. Then Aaron Sabato hurts his knee. Not ideal. Gennaro Miller will look to steal second. He is safe. Miller can pitch, he can hit, and he's pretty fast too. He's basically the Shohei Otani of AAA. So now there's a runner in scoring position for Kevin Alcantara to drive in, and it looks like he will. Really smart decision to have Miller steal second, otherwise he does not score here. And so the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp are on the board, an RBI single from Kevin Alcantara, and it's a 1-0 ball game. That'll bring up third baseman David Sende Los Santos, who was acquired at the Season 1 trade deadline from Arizona. He singles into center. Alcantara will make his way over to third. So now there's runners on the corners. Jacksonville's offense really starting to make some plays as that'll bring up Michael Koo, who had the awesome defensive play earlier. He strikes out on the slider. Not a bad inning, though. Jacksonville takes an early lead with an RBI single from Kevin Alcantara as we move into the third. Sebastian Espino strikes out. Another K for Robbie Jones. Again, he's not a strikeout guy, but these guys are all swinging and missing. There's another one. Tucker Toman goes down. Four strikeouts in the first three innings for Robbie Jones. Really good stuff as we go to the bottom of the third. Top of the order up for Jacksonville. Xavier Edwards draws the walk. Edwards was a little bit disappointing last year, but so far this season he's been pretty solid. That'll bring up Khalil Watson, who crushes this one in the right center field. And that one will one-hop off the wall. The speedster, Xavier Edwards, will score, and it's 2-0. Not including Woody Landry, Khalil Watson is Miami's best position player prospect. He is the fourth-ranked prospect in the organization and in the top 50, and for good reason, man. He's awesome. Ryan Poles singles into center. Watson will look to score, and he does. An RBI single for Ryan Poles, and it is now 3-0. 
Ryan Poles has been a little bit disappointing this year. I hoped for more out of him, but I think he'll be able to pick it up as the season goes along. Joaquin Goff starts the fourth with an infield single. Good effort there at second by Khalil Watson, but he's unable to make the play. Aurelis Martinez hits this one well in the left field. Encarnacion chasing after it as it goes off the wall. Runner should be able to score. It's an RBI double for Aurelvis Martinez. And the Buffalo Bisons are now on the board as it's a 3-1 ball game. Martinez 2-2 two for two in the early going. And Robbie Jones will finish the inning off with another strikeout. The Bisons do score, though, as we go into the top of the fifth. Still 3-1. Espino hits this one up the middle. Xavier Edwards with a really nice defensive play. Edwards and Watson really showing off the leather today in the middle infield. As we go to the bottom half of the inning, new pitcher for the Bisons. It'll be Tyler Herb checking into the game. He'll face off against Xavier Edwards, who hits this one to the opposite field. His second base knock of the day, and this one looks like it could go for a double. Edwards has got some wheels, too. 83 speed. There's no reason to think he shouldn't be able to score with the heart of the order due up. Ryan Poles is up with one away. He's got a 3-1 count, and he crushes this one. Inner center field. Back at the track at the wall. It is caught. That one had warning track power. Edwards will look to make it to third safely. So there's now a runner 90 feet away from home and a nice opportunity for Herrera Encarnacion who entered the game for the injured Aaron Sabato and he will strike out. Encarnacion was great in spring training but oddly enough he has been awful this year in AAA. Into the sixth inning now, Robbie Jones still in the game as Tucker Tolman singles in to right. Buffalo is starting to get some hits together over the last couple of innings, but Robbie Jones is still pitching quite well for the most part. Ryan McKenna, another guy who's had some major league experience with the Orioles, grounds into a 6-4-3 double play. Good work by the infield to quickly turn two. Full count for Joaquin Goff. He strikes out on the changeup. Another good inning for Robbie Jones. Can he make it through one or two more innings? Let's see. Still a 3-1 ball game as we go to the bottom half of the inning. Ethan Wilson is up. He was acquired in the season one off season in a trade with the division rival Phillies. Wilson hits this one into the opposite field. That one looks like it could go for extra bases. Wilson's another guy who we have high hopes for, but he's been a little bit disappointing so far this season. He's pretty close to being a big league caliber bat, and with how bad the Marlins bench has been, he could be making a big league impact, but he has struggled so far this year. With one away, Kevin Alcantara strikes out, and it'll be up to the number eight hitter, that is Davis and De Los Santos to drive them in. Full count here, two outs, runner on second for De Los Santos. And he hits this one well into right. That one should be able to drop, and it does not. So it will be caught, and the Jumbo Shrimp will not drive anybody in here. It remains 3-1 to one going into the seventh. Aralvis Martinez crushes this one into center field. Alcantara will only be able to watch it go over the fence for a solo homer. Martinez has driven in both runs today and is showing the Marlins why they maybe should have traded for him. So Robbie Jones will be taken out of the game. Pretty good start from him. Six innings, two earned. He'll be replaced by Evan Fitterer, who's been great so far this year in AAA. He has an ERA in the mid-ones and over 43 innings of work. As Austin Barnes hits this one past the diving glove of Edwards for a single. If Buffalo can get a little bit of the rally with Robbie Jones out of the game, who knows? They might be able to make this comeback. K. Dottie's going to bloop this one into right. It goes right in the middle of no man's land for a base hit. Barnes will make it to third, and things are now really getting interesting. The Bisons have runners on the corners, not to mention there's nobody out. Perfect opportunity for them to take the lead. Mercado grounds it to Watson. Should be a double play, and it will. Close call there. The Bisons do drive in the other run, though, so this game is tied at three. Sebastian Espino is up now, and he's going to hit this one fair into right. As that one goes into the corner, likely for extra bases as it bounces off of the wall for a double. So Espino's in scoring position. A base hit would put Buffalo ahead here. We'll see if they can do it. It's Miguel Hiraldo, a pretty solid prospect in the Blue Jays organization. He grounds out to second. Still a good inning, though, for the Bisons. They drive in two, and they're able to tie the game up. We'll see if the Jumbo Shrimp can answer here in the bottom half of the seventh as Xavier Edwards rips this one in the corner and it'll be fair. Edwards has had himself a great game. His third base hit of the day. That one's going to go for a double. And there's a runner in scoring position with the meat of the order due up. That'll start with second baseman Khalil Watson who hits this one high and deep in a center field. Back at the track. At the wall, it's gone. Two-run shot for Khalil Watson. 
That's his fifth on the year. And the Jumbo Shrimp are back ahead. So the Bisons get two in the top half of the inning. Pensacola answers right back with two of their own. 424 feet for Watson. His power has come along so much within the past season. And if he can develop that power, he can be a five-tool player in the bigs. Herrera Encarnacion will draw a walk. That was a close call, low fastball, but he will get the call. And so the Bisons will be making a pitching change. Former big league veteran Trevor Richards will check into the game as he looks to get out of it here, facing off against Gennaro Miller. 2-1 for Miller. He skies this one into left, and this one should be caught. A pretty exciting inning for both teams as they each drive in two, but the Jumbo Shrimp hold on to their two-run lead going into the eighth. Adrian Leone checks into the game. He was acquired, ironically, from the Blue Jays organization this offseason in a trade as he will walk Tucker Tillman. He will get Joaquin Goff to draw a walk as well. Leon struggling with his command of the strike zone as Aralvis Martinez gets his fourth hit of the game. He is four for four. He was looking to drive in his third run, and he will. It's an RBI single, and the Bisons are within one. So Leon will be quickly taken out of the game. He'll be replaced by Adam Seminaris, who will look to get Jacksonville out of the jam, and he will not be able to. Cave Dottie hits this one into the gap. This one could put the Bisons ahead. One run scores, a second run will join, and for the first time today, Buffalo has the lead as it's 6-5. Oscar Mercado singles into right. Runner will look to head home. The throw from Ethan Wilson a little bit offline, and Koo makes another incredible tag for the out. That's two runs that Michael Koo has saved with ridiculously athletic plays behind the plate. The throw was good, but again, a little bit offline, and it doesn't matter. Michael Koo with a phenomenal play. Despite that, though, the Bisons have the lead. Jacksonville will need to answer. Alcantara starts off the inning strong as he hits it into left field for a hit. So Jacksonville's got their base runner, and Alcantara is decently fast as well. 67 speed. De Los Santos goes down looking. That was a perfect pitch to Swenyat, and he lets it go right by him. Another pitching change here for Buffalo. Michael Givens will check into the game. How many former Orioles are we going to see? My God. He'll face off against Michael Koo. He's made some great plays defensively, and now he's going to get a big hit. Koo rips it into the gap. That one will look to score Alcantara. It's going to be an RBI double for the catcher, Michael Koo, and we are knotted up at six. What a fun game this has been. Back and forth here over the past few innings. Both bullpens getting rocked. And Xavier Edwards, who has a couple of hits today, has a chance to put his team on top, and he will not. He strikes out on the circle change. So Buffalo with a big inning. They score three. Jacksonville responds with one, and we go to the ninth. The Bisons will pick up right when they're left off as Sebastian Espino leads off the inning with a gapper. He's going to look to make his way over to third with a triple, and he is safe. The throw being a little bit offline, and so the potential go-ahead run is 90 feet away from home with nobody out. They're going to have no problem with scoring him as Miguel Geraldo hits this one into the gap. He could be looking at three as well. He's going to hold up at second, but that'll be a no-out double. The Bisons take a 7-6 lead, and they'll have a chance to extend the lead even more. Tucker Toman, top of the order, strikes out. That's a big one for seven hours. He really needed that one, but he does have Goff walk. So there's 2-1 for Aurelvis Martinez, who is now 5-5. Five for five. This one's going to be a gapper for extra bases. And that one's going to score two. Martinez now has four, five, six RBIs. I've lost count. Score now six to nine. Nice. So Carson Milbrandt with an ERA at 27 <laughs> will look to get out of the inning here, allowing no further damage. And that's exactly what happens as he strikes out Austin Barnes. Still a big inning for the Bisons, who have scored eight since the start of the seventh inning. Anthony Bender is in for the save. We know this name. He was with our organization in the first two seasons of the series before being traded in the offseason to Toronto. Clearly, he did not make the Blue Jays' final roster as he starts with a strikeout on Khalil Watson. Game comes down to Herrera Encarnacion. He'll strike out as well. So unfortunately, both of our minor league affiliates end up losing today in very high-scoring games. Pensacola lost 13-7. Jacksonville lost 6-9. So the offense, again, was really good for both teams. Aurelvis Martinez goes 5 for 5. He drove in 5 runs. He homered. He doubled 3 times. My lord. Our offense hit the ball pretty well. Homer for Khalil Watson. Plenty of extra base hits. Plenty of RBIs. Robbie Jones pitched really well, too. And then the bullpen 
sucked. We allowed eight runs in the final three innings, wasting away a great start from Robbie Jones. So after that loss, we will now shift our attention back to the big league club where hopefully we'll be able to get a win here today after not winning with either the double A or the triple A team. So as we alluded to earlier, the team is coming off a really solid month of April. We're 18 and 14. A lot of the young guys are playing pretty well. We're a game and a half out of first place in the division, and we've got some guys playing really well. Luisa Rise, Jazz Chisholm, and Nick Fortes have all been MVP candidates. Woody Landry's starting to pick things up after a slow start. He's getting more comfortable offensively. As for the pitching, Sandy Alcantara has been the best pitcher in the National League. Edward Cabrera is pitching a lot better. And even the young guys in the back, Jesus Luzardo and Yuri Perez, are both showing improvement, while the bullpen has been really solid as well, a lot better than last year. We're going to simulate our next three series against the Blue Jays, Yankees, and Giants. I want to face off against the Dodgers. We ended up going 4-4 four and four in the games we simmed. Very respectable. We lost the Blue Jays series. We split with the Yankees, and then we beat the Giants 2-1. to one. So, pretty solid. We're now 22-18. and 18. We're three games back of the Phillies in the division who are building up their lead while the Braves are continuing to fall backwards. So, it's time we start having a dialogue about Luis Arise. He has been the best hitter in baseball this year. He's hitting 400, OPS at 1143. He's matched his career high in homers. Keep in mind, we are in the middle of May. And his average is 61 points ahead of second place. He leads in hits. He's pretty high in home runs. It's kind of like Luis Arise in real life, where he's hitting 400, but he's actually hitting for power. He's third on the team in batting war because Jazz and Fortes are 1-2 and two in the NL. But Arise is first place for MVP, and Jazz is third. Arise is obviously winning the batting title. He's also winning the Hank Aaron. So, yeah, he has been ridiculous. His contract is up at the end of the year, and so far he has made himself a whole lot of money. Going into the season, I wasn't really sure if Luis Arise was going to fit in our long-term plans. But, yeah, I think it's safe to say he will. So we're going to face off against the Dodgers here, who are about as good as we are, 23-17. and 17. I wanted to play the second game, get a look at Edward Cabrera, and we'll be facing off against Mitch Keller, who's been unbelievably good this year. 2.11 ERA, .96 whip. Another guy who's in a contract year who's making himself a whole lot of money. Somebody's going to pay him a lot, and it's not going to be the Dodgers. They're actually trying to trade him, which is weird. You'd think a team like the Dodgers, who has so much money, would want to keep him? But I, I guess not. The first game of this series has quite the pitching matchup with Sandy facing off against Tony Gonsolin. The two of them have a combined ERA less than four, so naturally the two teams are going to combine to score 30. We end up losing 19 to 11. We started the game down 19 to 2 before making a big rally late and still losing by eight. There's a whole lot to look at here in this box score. So many runs, so many hits. The Dodgers pitching was pretty terrible, our pitching was also pretty terrible, and we had five errors! How do you have five errors? I do not get that! I thought our defense was pretty good, but we had five errors! That's not good! I don't know what's more concerning. The fact that we had literally five errors, or that Sandy Alcantara allowed six earned runs and didn't even throw two innings, Yet, he is still going to be in first place for the National League Cy Young because he's been so good through all of his other starts. Luis Arise, by the way, is now hitting 410. So he's basically doing what he is doing in real life, but he's hitting for power. So he's basically Ted Williams. So we're going to hop into this second game here against the Dodgers. I also want to point out before we start, though, Sixto Sanchez is now fully healthy. He got injured in spring training. We only have one more minor league option on him, and with Braxton Garrett struggling, I would almost rather just keep Sanchez with the team, use him as the long reliever, because there's not really a spot for him in the rotation, and we're going to send down Braxton Garrett because he's been pretty abysmal. So let's hop into this game here against the Dodgers, coming off a 19-11 loss. I'm going to take a wild guess and say both teams are going to score less, but... It's not like Sandy Alcantara and Tony Gonsolin are pitching, so you never know. The craziest part about the Dodgers scoring 19 runs is that they basically did it with their B team. Brendan Donovan is hurt, Shohei Otani is hurt, O'Neal Cruz is hurt, and today Will Smith is getting the day off. So they're literally playing without half of their lineup. Here's a look at Mitch Keller, who we talked about earlier. He's been one of the best pitchers in baseball this season. The Dodgers traded for Mitch Keller and O'Neill Cruz in separate trades with the Pirates for basically nothing. You got to feel bad for Pittsburgh fans at this point. The Dodgers got two superstars now for a whole lot of nothing. 
Brian De La Cruz is going to lead things off. The Marlins are mixing up the lineup card a little bit, and the thought process with De La Cruz leading off is he's not a very good clutch hitter, but with runners not on base, he is really good. So why not have him lead off where nobody's on? Sure enough, he hits a double. Luis Arise, who's now hitting 410, will single into right center. That should drive in De La Cruz, and it is now 1 0. Arise's average goes up to 414. That is utterly, absurdly ridiculous. That'll bring up Jazz Chisholm, who's had a true breakout season. He's been just as good as Luis Arise. Arise is going to look to steal second, and he is not even close. The thought process here is that Jazz Chisholm, unlike Brian De La Cruz, is a really good clutch hitter. So by getting a rise in scoring position, we would be upping Jazz's contact, but that decision ends up not paying off. And sure enough, Jazz will ground out to short. Still a pretty good inning, though. The Marlins take a 1-0 lead off of an RBI single by Ted Willie. I mean, Luisa Rise. Let's get a look at Edward Cabrera here in the bottom of the first inning. He started the year off really poorly. His first few starts were rough. But since then, he's looked a lot more like the Edward Cabrera from last year, who became one of the best young pitchers in the game, as he gets the former Marlin Gene Segura to check swing on a high and inside sinker. Freddie Freeman with two away rips it into left, and Charles LeBlanc drops the ball. What in the world? That's going to be a double. They should call that an error. I get it's kind of a tough play for LeBlanc, but that was right in his glove. How do you not catch that? Charles LeBlanc is getting the start here for Anthony Santander, who's getting the day off. LeBlanc, who was really good last year, has been abysmal at the plate, and now he's making bad defensive plays. So Edward Cabrera is basically going to have to get four outs in this inning, and he does by striking out Mookie Betts on the outside slider. Good work from Cabrera, one nothing going into the second. Nick Fortes continuing his phenomenal season, pops this one into right. Is that one going to drop? It will not. Good play by Mookie Betts to get the first out of the frame. That'll bring up Jesus Sanchez. He's been up and down this year. He's had some good moments, but it's been a little bit inconsistent. He goes down looking on the fastball. How many times has Jesus Sanchez gone down looking in games we've watched this year, especially in full counts? I feel like he's been so unlucky. Michael Bush strikes out. Good pitch from Edward Cabrera into the third. The former Dodger, Gavin Lux, acquired last year at the deadline, rips it into left. That'll go for a hit. Gavin Lux has been phenomenal ever since being acquired from the Dodgers. I feel like they're really kicking themselves for making that trade. Charles LeBlanc goes down on the slider, continuing his rough season, to put it nicely. Woody Landry is now up here for the Marlins. Runner on first, two away. And that pitch is going to be way outside. The catcher, Diego Cartaya, is unable to field it. And so now there's a runner in scoring position as Lux is able to swipe second. So a base hit from Woody Landry should be able to score Gavin Lux here. But Woody's just going to weakly chop it over to first. Freddie Freeman sends it over to Keller. And that will get the Dodgers through the third. Still 1-0. Miami ahead. James Outman is up early here in the bottom of the third. He checks swings on the curveball. Edward Cabrera is continuing his hot streak. He's having another really good start. I get that the Dodgers are playing without half of their starting lineup. But this is still a really solid Dodgers team. Gene Segura singles into right, so that'll give the Dodgers a base runner here with two away for Chris Taylor, who goes down to the inside fastball. That would have been ball 4-2, but Cabrera's stuff is just a little bit too filthy. one nothing going into the fourth. Both Cabrera and Keller have looked pretty much as advertised today. Keller strikes out Jazz Chisholm on the fastball. Good pitch for the first out of the inning. Into the bottom of the fourth, Freddie Freeman. Strikes out on the fastball. Even at 35 years old, Freddie Freeman, steady Freddie, still one of the best hitters in the game. Mookie Betts, still fantastic as well as he goes down on the sinker. Freeman and Betts are really the only two healthy stars here for the Dodgers, unless you want to count Trace Thompson as a star. He's been a really good offensive player for them the last few years, the brother of Clay Thompson, as he strikes out. Cabrera would strike out the side in the bottom of the fourth, and we will move on to the fifth. Jesus Sanchez hits this one high and deep in the right field. Back at the track, at the wall, it is caught. That one looked like it was gone. Great swing. It had more than enough arc on it. He hit it really hard, but it just does not have enough. That's a home run in multiple other ballparks. Gavin Lux now rips this one high and deep in a right at the track, at the wall, it's caught. Again, the Marlins with another really good swing. I feel like Miami's hit the ball pretty well today. But they haven't really been lucky with where these balls have been going. one nothing into the bottom of the fifth. Michael Bush goes down looking on the slider. Edward Cabrera continuing to reel and deal. A masterclass from Cabrera today as Deshaun Baxter hits this one high 
And deep in the left at the track at the wall, it's caught. We've had a lot of close ones here in the fifth inning. I feel like it's only a matter of time until one of these offenses is able to break through. James Altman hits this one into left field. That'll go for a hit. Altman's going to look to make it to second as LeBlanc fields it slowly. And that'll be a double. The Marlins were way too nonchalant fielding that ball. And Altman will take advantage. So he's in scoring position for the catcher, Diego Cartaya. He grounds it to short. Gavin Lux makes the play. That's five scoreless for Edward Cabrera, who is dominating this Dodger lineup. Still 1-0. Very low scoring game, certainly contrary to the two minor league games we had today. As we move into the sixth, Mitch Keller is still dominating as he faces off against Woody Landry. That one will be bobbled in the infield, and they will not make the play. They're going to rule that as a hit. I think that's a right call. That's a really tough play for the shortstop to make. I don't think he can expect him to make it. And it ups Woody's batting average, so not complaining. From there, Mitch Keller is going to be taken out of the game. Really solid start for Keller. He goes nearly six, only allowing the one run so far. He'll be replaced out of the bullpen by Jimmy Nelson, who has also been really good this year because the Dodgers just get really good players to grow on trees. He's allowed one run in 12 innings so far, but he's got to face off against Luis Arise, who's hitting over 410. Woody's going to look to steal second. He is safe. Arise is also one of the best clutch hitters in the game. Now, his contact rating and clutch rating are both the same. They're both 99, so it doesn't change, but it does get a runner in scoring position, but he's just going to strike out. Really feels like Luis Arrives could have drove in another run, but it won't happen as it remains one to nothing. Are either of these teams going to score anytime soon? Cabrera's over 100 pitches, and it does not matter. He strikes out Chris Taylor on the sinker for the first out of the inning. Freddie Freeman is now up. He's going to ground this one over to second. Luis Arrives makes the play. That is six scoreless for Edward Cabrera. Does he have enough in the tank to go a few more innings? He's over 100 pitches, but he has not shown any signs of slowing down. Into the seventh now, Jazz Chisholm is up for the Marlins. He has 99 career homers. Could this one be 100? Back at the track, at the wall, it is caught. This is unbelievable. Are any of these balls going to go over the fence? For Christ's sake. And that would have been his 100th as well. That would have been really cool. Nick Fortes is up now. He's been pretty quiet. 0 for 2. Looking to get on the board with a hit. He hits this one high and deep in a center field. Please be the one at the track at the wall. Jesus Christ, it's caught again. How many balls have the Marlins sent to the warning track today? Like four? Jesus Sanchez is now up. And he strikes out on the knuckle curve. Good inning for the Dodgers, and it'll remain 1-0 as we go into the bottom of the seventh. It feels like the Marlins should have like six right now. Edward Cabrera has been so unlucky, and guess what? It hasn't mattered. He's still been dominant. He will walk Mookie Betts to start the inning. That's not good. You know what is good? A grounder to first. Landry to Lux to Cabrera. 3-6-1. Double play. Good job by Miami. Can Cabrera get out of the seventh? He faces off against Bush, who grounds it to third. Jacob Berry makes the play. That is seven scoreless for Edward Cabrera. It would be nice to take him out here at like 120 pitches, but if the Marlins are not going to score, they're going to need to keep Cabrera in the game. Alex Reyes will check in for the Dodgers here in the eighth. 3.38 ERA on the season. He's allowed two runs in five and a third innings. He'll face off against Gavin Lux. Lines this one to third. Segura got a hand on it. And the throw to first is not in time. Good hustle by Gavin Lux, and he is aboard. That'll bring up Brian De La Cruz. He hits this one high, pretty deep in right field. This one does not have the carry, and it will be caught. The previous game, both of these teams combined to score 30. Don't forget that. And then here, the score is 1-0, and nobody has scored since the top of the first inning. Cabrera still in the game here in the bottom of the eighth. He faces off against Deshaun Baxter, grounded to first. Good play by Woody. Cabrera is over 120 pitches. He's still not slowing down. He might take this the entire way. James Altman is up now. It's this one sharply into center for a hit. So the Dodgers get the potential tie and run aboard. And again, James Altman is really fast. 82 speed. Full count for Diego Cartaya. That's a walk on Cabrera's 135th pitch of the game. With him allowing two runners and having such a high pitch count, we can't keep him in the game. We don't want his arm to fall off. So we're going to take him out here. What a performance from Edward Cabrera. Seven and a third innings. No earned runs yet. 
But we'll see if the Dodgers can get these two guys in. The problem for LA is they're going to have to face off against Camilo Duvall. He's got a 1.69, nice ERA, and just under 11 innings. He's only allowed two runs so far, both of which were solo homers. And he'll face off against Gene Segura, who swings and misses at the cutter. That would have been ball four. The bases would have been loaded. But instead, he strikes out, and it's up to Chris Taylor. Taylor with a 1-1 count, pops it into center. Jazz Chisholm should be able to make the play, and Camilo Duvall will get out of the jam. The score remains 1-0 going into the top of the ninth. Both of these teams have had so many opportunities to score, and they just aren't doing it. Bruce Dark Gratterall is into the game for the Dodgers. We're pretty familiar with Gratterall here on this channel. We had him for a little while in the Orioles series in MLB The Show 21. He'll face off against Luis Arise, who is only 1-3. for three. One for three is good for just about anybody else, but not him as he goes down looking on the cutter. So he will finish his night one for four with so far the only RBI. Jazz Chisholm is up now, full count. And Jazz hits this one high and deep in the right center. Will this be the one? Yes, it is. Finally, we get one to go over the fence. Jazz Chisholm with his 100th career big league homer. Of course, San Diego Studios decides to not make a graphic for it, but trust me, it is his 100th. It's also his 12th of the year, and the Miami Marlins will up the lead. It's now 2-0. We finally have runs for the first time since the top of the first inning. Somebody scores. You'd think there'd be more scoring when both teams just dropped 30, but no, that's not the case as Fortes goes down on the high cutter. So Miami leads by two, going into the bottom of the ninth off of the homer by Jazz Chisholm, and now it's up to Liam Hendricks to finish the game. He's 9 for 11 in save opportunities this year. He started off 9 for 9, but his last two kind of blew up in his face. So he'll face off against Freddie Freeman, who goes down on the knuckle curve for out number one. Good start. That'll bring you up Mookie Betts. This one is hit well into left field, and now the offenses are coming together. Solo home run for Mookie Betts, and the Dodgers are going to make it interesting. It's now 2 to 1. Mookie with his 10th homer of the year. So both teams trade off runs here in the ninth inning. We'll see if the Dodgers can get another one and get Hendricks to blow his third save of the year. Third in a row, to be specific, as he strikes out Trace Thompson. And it comes down to Michael Bush. Grounds this one to third. Jacob Berry should be able to make the play. And he will. The Marlins win a nail-biter. 2-1 to one is your final. And Edward Cabrera masterclass. No earned runs in seven and a third. After his first few starts, I was a little bit concerned for him, but he's back in business. He looks as good as he did last season. Great win here for the Marlins against a really good Dodgers team on the road. And again, I get the Dodgers were playing basically all of their backups, but still, you'll take a great outing from Cabrera when you get it. The offense was not good, though. We had six hits. We had the RBI from Arise early, the late homer from Jazz Chisholm in the ninth. But other than that, the offense didn't give us a lot. I will say they were better than the box score showed. There were four or five balls that could have been homers, but this game was about the pitching. Edward Cabrera was so good. The Dodgers offense, similarly to us, had a few close opportunities, but they just were not quite able to get anything going. A nice win there as we score a combined total of three runs after the 30 run output the night before. We're going to simulate the final game of the Dodgers series along with three games here against the Pittsburgh Pirates who have been really struggling this year. Taylor Trammell, who started the year off injured, is now healthy. And I've talked about Trammell as a guy who I won in the big league club. And with how bad our bench has been, why not? Taylor Trammell was really good at the end of last year with the majors. He was pretty good in spring training as well. I would like to have him as a bench bat. On the flip side, Charles LeBlanc, who was one of my favorite stories last year, has not been good this year. 148 average, sub 200 on base, and OPS at 400. He's been hitting basically like a pitcher, so he needs to go down to the minors to get his act together. We lost the final game against the Dodgers, but we do sweep the Pirates, so we're now 26 and 20. We're still in second place behind the Phillies. The Braves are continuing to dig themselves a hole. I don't know how they're 20 and 28. Their roster is so loaded. We're currently the number one wild card, but look how close the race is. The team who is the number five wild card spot is only a game behind us. The team in seventh is only two games behind us. There's only five really bad teams in the NL, and one of them's the Braves, who you've got to assume are going to play better. So it is a really loaded NL wild card race, and we're going to have to keep playing well. 
The problem is our schedule is really hard. We play the Padres, Phillies, and Braves, and Mets, who are decent, in both May and June. We also see the Houston Astros in June as well. So we've got a really challenging schedule, and it'll be an interesting test to see if this team is legitimately a potential playoff contender, or if we're going to be towards the middle like we've been over the last few years. I think this team has the capability of being a playoff team. We've got some guys playing like superstars, and we've got some other guys playing like they belong in the minors. It's been a weird balance. We've got a lot of guys who are playing really well and a lot of guys who are really struggling hope everybody enjoyed the episode make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new i know it was a long one but we had three really fun games here today peace out